man, it's funny, I get, I get emotional remembering it because I was so, I was just so hopeful. In the Old Testament, there's this moment when Moses and the Israelites are running from the Egyptians. This is their escape from Egypt. And they get to the edge of the Red Sea and there's nowhere else to go. The only thing that's possible is for them to go through it. And of course, they can't go through it. So God parts the waters of the Red Sea. There's this concept of what my wife now calls the Red Sea moment, which I find myself in and the show finds itself in on a regular basis where you do everything you can and then you get to this moment where you've got nothing left. There's nothing more you can do to accomplish this seemingly impossible task. And getting comfortable in that Red Sea moment where you're just waiting is probably the hardest thing that I'm ever having to do. And on season two, there's been three in particular that were really significant where it was just shown to me over and over again that I'm, I'm not fully in control of this. The season two is significantly bigger and different. It's in a new location from season one. So we can't go back to where we filmed season one. And we're looking at places all over the world, but COVID's making it difficult to travel. Uh, none of us really wanna go overseas for three months. And in the States, there really aren't too many, you know, first century uh, sets uh, other than one. There's a huge one in Utah. For a couple of years, I had been hopeful that we could get a set like that. But every time that the opportunity came up, the answer was no. It's never actually been done for anyone outside of the, the LDS church, so I'm not going to get my hopes up. So sure enough, I get a call from a guy by the name of Brad Pello, who is a fan of the show. So he calls me up and he says, I think that there's an opening. I think that the church is willing to consider this. I'd love for you to come visit the set. And I literally was like, <laughs> okay, I think Maybe there's something opening up. Maybe I can get my hopes up just a little bit, so I'm gonna go visit the set. So I go to visit the set, and it's the most extraordinary film set I've ever seen in my life. I felt like I was transported to, to the first century. Like, this is what it feels like, this is what it looks like, and it was just extraordinary. And I felt, like, not, an, of course, not an audible voice, but I felt God, like, speaking on, to my heart. Lives are gonna be changed from the content that we're going to get on this set. I just felt a kinship with, <laughs> with this, concrete structure. And we were up against a deadline now, and the answer is no, we can't use the set. And I texted my wife, Amanda, and I said, they just said no. And, I, and, and, and she says, call me. He says, so we're talking on the phone. I go, they just said no, and now I have no idea where to shoot. And Amanda just goes, yeah, I don't think so. She says, I just think God's taking you to the edge of the Red Sea so that when the waters part, you'll know it's him. And I kind of chuckled and thought, well, stop it, like stop getting, I, I, stop getting my hopes up. Like they just said, no, I'm done with this. The decision's made and we need, to be, we need to find a place to shoot now. So I went to the farm where we made this Christmas short film about the birth of Christ that went viral and launched the entire project. I don't have answers. And the reason that I'm here on this farm is because this is where I go. It's owned by a very dear friend of mine, and it's where I go about once or twice a year when I really want to hear from God. I get away from everything, and I just try to listen, um, which is something I'm not great at. There's this amazing song called Faithful Now that's done by Vertical Church Worship, which is the part of the church that I was part of for seven, eight years. And there are these lyrics of this song. I am holding on to faith, because I know you'll make a way. And I don't always understand, And I don't always get to see, but I will believe it. I will believe it. And that's just the song that was like laid on my heart, saying, look, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't, and I don't understand, but I know something will happen, something positive will happen. And long story short, in the middle of July, another gentleman wakes up at four in the morning and feels led to call up one of the main leaders of the LDS church and said, have you seen this thing? We have got to make this happen. We, why aren't we using the set for this purpose? This is why the set was built. Like we've got to make this happen. So I end up getting this Zoom call in the middle of July with two of the top leaders of the entire LDS church. And I just said, look, if we're not supposed to be shooting on this set, I don't want to. I, I just want to do whatever God wants. I just want to be wherever we're supposed to be. But I just laid out, here's the 
point of the show. Here's the mission of the show. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to tell these stories of Jesus in an authentic way. And your set is, in my opinion, the greatest opportunity literally in the world to do that. But we have to know now. And they believed in it. They liked it. We had a great talk. And then they had to get a decision from even higher up on the chain of command. The final decision makers all left for the month. They said, I don't even know how we're going to reach them. But they ended up sending an email. And the next morning, uh, we got a phone call that said, uh, Goshen set is a go. You're going to be there in August. And it was like that. It was like <laughs> Red Sea parted like that. And I'm, of course, completely gobsmacked and I'm, and I'm emotional. And, you know, I get the text, I'm downstairs and I, I walk up and I just, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm emotional even now thinking about it, but when I was with her, and I just show her the text. And she's not emotional because she's like, yeah, I know, like, told you. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't say it in a cocky way, it was just like, yeah, I know, That's, this is, so now you know that the Red Sea parted and it wasn't you? Like, yeah, yeah, I got that. For season two, that was the first Red Sea moment, and that was actually the first time Amanda came up with that term. You know, I think God is taking you to the edge of the Red Sea, so the waters part, you know it's him. And uh, mission accomplished, because we for sure knew <laughs> that one was not us. We've gotten to the point on this project where the fact that we're even doing this is insane. The fact that we're able to do a project like this completely outside the system, that's 100% free, and yet we're able to do multiple seasons of this thing. Um, financed by people all over the world is extraordinary. Well, we might as well keep trying to do extraordinary things, trying to do impossible things. And we paint ourselves into these corners just, <laughs> I don't know why we do it, but it's kind of like, hey, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep trying for, for crazy things. So we had this idea for uh, the opening of episode three of season two, where what if we did the first 15 minutes, this whole sequence in one shot? We call that a one-er. And we've done it before, but usually for like uh, two minutes or you know, three minutes tops. Uh, we did it in season one, for example, when Simon and Andrew are walking down a street and they're talking and we just did it. And it usually takes like nine or 10 takes because something always goes a little bit wrong. An actor might mess up a line or the extras in the background, might, the timing might be a little bit off or there's an audio problem or whatever it is. So you just start over and you just do it again. Because you have no, you can't make any mistakes in a one because you can't cut around it. It's like theater actually. In theater you don't get to stop and go again. What so if you mess up in this tape? Uh, you ruin the day for everybody. Yeah, we have to start all the way over. Yeah. So, uh, so no I, will, uh, yeah, I will not be stuffing right. up, hopefully. We're thinking, Let's do it for 15 minutes, which is unprecedented for television at least. Um, and let's also do it in a scene where there's going to be tons of people and tons of movement. Uh, it starts in this line of people where Matthew and Philip are walking through and then they go backstage behind where Jesus is doing all these miracles. And there's seven, eight people and we're going to be weaving in and out in front of them. And we just thought, stupid, ridiculous, highly likely to fail, but uh, let's go for it because if it works, it's gonna, it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna really fit the storyline, it's gonna fit the moment, it's gonna add to this intimacy and to the urgency of the moment and playing things out in real time. So what do we need to do to make that happen? Well, we need to rehearse a lot. So you get the actors out there and you spend the morning, the entire morning rehearsing. Normally you rehearse for 15 minutes and then you shoot all your different angles for the next few hours. Well, we spent the whole morning before lunch rehearsing. We're gonna be rehearsing for the next several hours. It's gonna be clunky, it's gonna be like theater, you know, when you're first getting on the stage and you're mapping things out and figuring out where people are walking to and where they're gonna stand. And um, so I, I've, I've given this kind of speech before, but it's never been more true than it is now, which is you just have to all really be patient. And we brought in this specialist um, named Chad who has a special rig that he can do, a special steady cam that allows him to move even more so than the average steady cam. Typically, when you have the camera in one direction, the, ca the crew can be behind the camera. But in this case, the camera's gonna be moving around all the time, so the crew can't be anywhere. A few of us hid into Jesus' tent, so you actually see Jesus' tent in the shot, and we uh, closed the tent so you couldn't see us, of course, but that's where we were watching the monitors. So we thought, let's get a good one during the day, and then once we know that that's our safety net, we know we've got a good one, then we can take the chance of trying to do it during magic hour. Our first couple takes don't work at all, which we expected. And then we're like, all right, well, the sun is starting to go down a little bit. 
And so we start this take and we're like, we better hustle. And about a third of the way into the take, the shadows are so extreme, you can literally see the, the, the whole camera crew on the, on the actors. We've done three or four takes by this point and none of them are usable and we're done for, meaning we can't shoot for the next couple hours. We have to wait until the sun is low enough that there's not gonna be shadows, but then that brief window where it's low enough, no shadows, but you can still see people <laughs> before the sun completely goes down and we're done and we didn't get it. And here we are again, Red Sea moment. And I'm out in the field by myself, arms outstretched. I know that God has many bigger things to, to worry about than one shot of my show. But what I was just saying was, look, if we're not supposed to do this, Warner, if this is just a bad idea, can you just please make it obvious so we don't keep wasting time? And so we come back, the sun was going down and, and our cinematographer said, we're gonna lose light totally in 20 minutes. And the shot is 15 minutes, so we need to go now. So we start rolling and one of the actors says a line wrong. So we go to take two and now we've got 17 minutes for a 15 minute shot. Same thing happens. And I walk out of the tent, I take my, my script that I have in my hand and I, I, I throw it to the side because I'm so upset and concerned. And I go to the actors and I go to the crew and I calm everybody down. I go, okay, you know, we, can, we can do this. Let's just relax, take a deep breath. We gotta stop thinking about everything and just let the scene happen. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I'm walking back to the tent and it's, we have 15 minutes for a 15 minute shot. Like this is it. And I get back into the tent and we start rolling. And right away I can tell that the actors are relaxed. The performances are actually better than they've been all day. One minute in, I'm going, oh, this scene is the best it's been. Like, this is really great. That's gonna be really painful if something goes wrong now. And as we're watching it halfway through, because the camera is away from the monitors, so the signal goes out, I can't even watch it. The cinematographer can't even watch it. We're just staring there at a blank screen. <laughs> and it was almost like God was going, I'm taking away everything from you. And I'm like, I can't even see. So I'm just staring at a blank monitor begging to be able to see something. Finally, the monitor comes back up. I have no idea how the past two, two minutes went. And one thing we noticed was like, look at the lighting. Oh my goodness, this shot looks so unbelievable right now. You can see the sun going down in the shot. This is extraordinary. One of my producers, Chris, is standing next to me and we're not looking at each other. We're, we might as well be holding hands, but we don't even want to jinx anything. So we're just, I, I can feel the, our breath our, you know, increasing. We're just going, Oh, please, oh, please. Like, I just know what he's thinking. And there are a couple moments when the actors, you could tell, were slightly pausing in their lines because they were working out and they're like, oh, please, oh, please. At one point, the camera operator, we see the, the camera jolt a little bit near the end because he, he was, his arms were shaking so hard that it was all he could do just to hold it steady. And we could actually hear his breathing through the microphone because he was so exhausted. Man, it's funny, I get... I get emotional remembering it because I was so, I was just so, I'm stressed is the right word, but I was so hopeful. It took me back to the moment in the Old Testament when Moses has to ha have his hands held up. And as long as his hands are held up, the, the, big, the, the, the battle's gonna be won. And his hands are, his arms are so tired that he literally has two people holding his arms up. And I felt like through prayer, I wanted to be holding up the arms of the camera operator so he could keep the camera going. We finally get to the end of the scene and they deliver it and it's awesome. And the cinematographer turns back to me because everything looked great from his end and he's like, please tell me we got it. And I'm like, I, th I think we got it. And I walk out and the camera operator is literally collapsed. They're pouring water over his head because he's, he's so overheated and drained. He's just look collapsed and sweat is pouring down. They've taken the camera from him. And we look at the monitor to watch the shot. It's the most beautiful shot of, 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 the, of the season. And we got it and I just, I literally, I walked over to one of the actors to thank them and everyone's clapping and cheering because we, we couldn't believe we got it. And I just burst into tears. I just started crying and he's like, are you okay? Are you okay? No, I'm just, dude, oh, dude. Dude, that was a lot for everybody. What's funny is the, the, the lighting in that last 15 minutes was even better than it would have been five minutes ago. Even the mess up of the actor made the shot better. If we could have chosen, no pun intended, the best 15 minutes of the day to shoot this one shot, it was those exact 15 minutes. There was no reason to feel confident going into that last take because we'd done takes before and none of them had worked. So when your evidence for potential success is just multiple examples of failure, 
It's not exactly the most confidence-inducing moment. If anything defines a Red Sea moment in the show, that, that moment was it, because I was, I was literally powerless. It's, it's a place I'm learning to, to, to be in quite often now. The best example, obviously, of a literal Red Sea moment in many ways is when you're stuck because of the weather. It's been a challenge constantly to overcome the weather uh, on this show. Throughout the show, it's, it, the stakes were relatively small. We could kind of get through it. The Sermon on the Mount day was super cold, but we were still at least able to film, and so we got through that. But the biggest one was coming up near the end of the shoot. We had a day of filming on the lake. This was one of those days where we only had one day to shoot in that location. We weren't gonna be able to do it again. Also, we had a couple actors who were scheduled to leave the next day. In one case, to the case of George Xanthus, who plays John, he was flying back to Australia. And so we had, we had to shoot on that day, and in the days leading up to it, I'm talking to Amanda, again, the person that I go to when I'm in a Red Sea moment, I'm going, you know, we got this day coming up that's looking like thunderstorms, and I don't know if we're gonna be able to make it, and this is gonna screw up our entire shoot. And she says to me, I feel like it's going to be fine. And she just said, I feel like God has just laid it on my heart that you're going to be protected from the weather. And I chuckled again. I don't believe that the chosen is going to dictate the weather for the entire area, but she just felt like we were gonna be fine. So we get to that day, and good news is that morning there was no rain. And I'm thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. The bad news is, is that at the beginning of the day at least, there was fog that was so thick you couldn't even see 20 feet into the water. It was unshootable. We have two big scenes to shoot that day, a total of about eight or nine pages, which typically takes minimum 12 hours in a day to shoot, but that's pushing it. That means we have to work really, really fast. And the, the radar is telling us that this fog isn't gonna clear up until around lunchtime, which means we'd have half a day to film two big scenes. Not possible. My co-writer, Ryan, is on the set with me and we are already starting to think about what are some of the things we can cut from these scenes or what are some angles we can maybe give up on so that we at least get some footage. Another hour goes by and this fog is getting thicker. And we're approaching lunch and I'm like, we're, we're, now the radar's telling us it's not going away till two o'clock. And so I text Amanda again and I go, um, we haven't shot, we're four hours in, we haven't shot anything. I don't even know if we're gonna be able to pull this off. And she says, start thanking God for what he's going to do. And I'm like, yeah, mm, a little too early for that. <laughs> She's like, it's gonna be good. And I'm like, stop it. And I walk out, you know, 20 yards into the water, standing in the middle of the fog, and I do my typical, like, God, feels like another Red Sea moment. Can we get an idea? Can we at least get a decision soon so that we can figure out what we're gonna do? Uh, we decide to go ahead and break for lunch. And now we're halfway through the day and we've got nothing. And then we find out from the radar that the fog is gonna be here till the end of the day. So we're done for. So I go to the actors and I go, guys, um, it doesn't look like we're gonna be able to shoot today. And we decide to make the decision uh, all right, guys, go ahead and go. And I'm in the makeup trailer talking to the actors, which is about half a mile from the actual set. And I look out the window and I go, is that the lake? Because I can see through the trees and previously it had just been a big wall of fog, but I could see the water, which I hadn't seen all day from where I was standing. Like, is that the lake? And I start hearing yelling. The fog is clearing, the fog is clearing. Don't go, don't go, don't go. But we pull them all back and we're rushing to the edge of the water and I get there. And they told me at, at, that they were literally taking the boat that we were gonna be filming on one of the scenes and they were pulling it into the harbor and starting to put it onto the truck. And they were standing there and they said this gust of wind came. It was literally like, and the fog just went whoosh, off the lake so fast that they could see the other side of the lake in, in, in seconds from when they had previously not even been able to see 20 yards. And they all started you know, yelling in the walkies, oh my gosh, the lake is good, get the boat, get the boat back. Yeah, Mitch was like, all of a sudden he could see that. We and, started, then, and then they started the putting the boat started saying we're gonna put the boat away. We started putting it away <laughs> and we were like, oh, I can kinda see the trees a little bit. And we were like, weird. And we started seeing those, that shore and we were like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like Adam, Adam. It's like a horror, horror film. Well, 
No, yeah. <laughs> so we get the bow back and the crew is running. We get to the edge of the lake. The actors are getting there. And my cinematographer, Akis, says, okay, well, the sun's going down in two hours anyway. So at most, we, we can only do one scene. And I said, uh, I'm gonna try to get both scenes in. He thought I was joking. And I go, if we just do this scene in one or two shots, then we can go to the next scene, which is in a boat. Simon and Andrew are out in a boat on the lake, which is very difficult to film. But I'm like, we could just get that in one shot. So we film a couple takes of this first scene, which is the four uh, disciples throwing rocks. And it goes fine. And we're like, oh, the light looks good. Let's keep going. We end up getting all the angles that we wanted because the light still looked great. We filmed this four page scene in an hour and a half, which is unprecedented. It normally would take us five hours. And we're like, all right, let's get the boat out in the water. Let's try to get one shot off here. Sun's going down, here we go. So we get the boat out in the water and the waves are coming a little bit too. So the boat's kind of rocking. So we have to have two guys literally holding the boat in place. I'm like, all right, let's get one shot off. We've got two cameras set up, let's just get this. And my cinematographer goes, well, we're here. Let's just do it again. So we do it again. All right, well, let's get the other angle. So we get another angle. The, the clouds in the sky were reflecting the sunlight. We ended up getting every angle that we had planned on. We shot both of these scenes, the one on the, on the shore and the one in the water, eight to nine pages in three hours. And my cinematographer said, it felt like the day just kept extending. And I didn't even have time during the filming because we were going so fast to text Amanda and go, hey, we're gonna try to get a shot off. So the, the day ends and we've got everything. Everything that we needed in three hours. And I walk by myself, I go off by myself again, and I start crying again, going, Red Sea moment. And I remembered that when I had gone out into the water and I had had my hands out and just saying to God, I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, my wife is telling me to thank you in advance for what you're gonna do. That feels pretty ridiculous right now, but it'd be nice for something good to happen here because I don't know what to do. And it's again one of those situations where as a director I have, I'm completely powerless because I can't control the weather. I can't clear the fog. I can't extend the day. And it happened. And even the fact that we were able to shoot in three hours doesn't make any sense. It's impossible math, which has been another phrase that came from my wife that has defined this entire project. And I texted her <laughs> and I said, so uh, we, the fog finally cleared in five minutes and we got absolutely everything we were gonna get for the whole day. And of course I'm a mess. I don't know how, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, but that was near the end of the shoot and it was the, the capper, the, 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 the exclamation point on this entire season of saying, I, of God saying to me, I want you in these Red Sea moments. I want you in that place where you've done everything you can and the only thing left is for the seas to be parted. And in this case, it was the fog being parted. It was, it felt like the most literal example of a Red Sea moment I could face. And if I continue to need to learn that lesson, that's okay. Because every time it happens, I'm so grateful for the reminder that this project is not mine. And I used to be someone for whom that would be a really scary thought. And now it's the best place to be. And I feel more content and joyful being in this place of surrender and desperation and helplessness. There's no better place to be than that.